at what point did you say, I'm not in the mood to make another film, knowing how things are, knowing some of the battles that I might face with the next one, but I have another idea. Um, in so we finished shooting Like the Water in August of 2011, and we went immediately into post. Um, I wish, actually, we had taken a little bit of a breather and kind of, you know, checked back in with, because the editing process, you always get lost in the forest for the trees. And while the director was in the editing room and she was quite lost in the forest for the trees, I was out trying to figure out what were the next steps for the film. Um, I went to AFM for the first time, which is my least favorite place on the planet. Um, and uh, I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but whatever. Um, but uh, sometime around when I started learning about how uh, you have a film, you get it into a festival, usually because a sales agent has helped you or you know the sales agent picks you up at the festival and the sales agent helps you sell it to a distributor and the distributor helps you package it and, uh, well, actually spends your money to um, package it for the exhibitor and market it to an audience. And then the exhibitor collects the money that your audience spends on your movie and they take a cut. And the distributor takes a cut plus everything that they spent to do all that stuff. And then the sales agent takes a cut. And by the time it gets back to you, there's no money left. None. I mean, I have friends who had films get picked up at Sundance by the distributors that you hope to get picked up by, and they made zero dollars on it. And I was like, well, that's not sustainable. Like, for whom is that sustainable? Um, so that was really the point that I thought, well, there's an interesting thing that happened when we made Like the Water, which was we knew because we weren't going to get traditional financing that we had to reach out to our community. And we reached out to them with a clear story. And the first part of that story was, here is why we think we need to make this movie now um, and what it means to us personally to do this. And two, actually it's three things, two, what we think it might mean to women filmmakers, to women in general, to, um, to the representation, better representation in film. And then the third piece was, and here is every specific thing we need to make this movie. And what happened was when we went out with this list, we call it the original wish list, um, which was just a, a list that we typed into our WordPress website. We put a little PayPal link in the bottom. Um, when people could see exactly what their contribution to the film was, the car rental, the sunscreen, the bug spray, which was really important if you're shooting in Maine in the summer, get bug spray. Um, people tended to contribute more than we had thought and then they started loaning us stuff we hadn't considered. And they started loaning us locations and goods and services that we didn't think we could get. And they took our tiny little you know, $85,000 movie and made it look much bigger and much fancier. I mean, we, we look for the locations that were loaned to us, like a $5 million movie, and those were all loaned to us. It made our film better because we had this early interaction with our audience. And then as we continued into the festival circuit, no matter where our film screened, anywhere in the world, and I'm, I'm including Oaxaca and Romania and Memphis, was it Memphis, Tennessee? No, somewhere in Mississippi, and obviously in Maine where we shot it, somebody who contributed to that campaign or somebody who knew somebody who did showed up. And when we did screenings for our community, we had lines down the block and around the corner. We could sell out a 350-seat theater. And this is for a tiny, independent drama about grief starring only women, mostly unknown actors, right? And so at that moment when I saw kind of the, the wreckage of the business model that indie filmmakers, even in the best case scenario, were being promised, and this incredible investment from the audience that was created out of this wish list model, um, and this was at the end of 2011, I was like, maybe we could, maybe there's something in there and that's when I really started exploring it. And it was another sort of six months until it was fully ideated um, as this uh, sort of one-stop shop crowdfunding and distribution. And obviously in the last two years, we have iterated on the idea quite a bit because we've gotten so much feedback from the community and they've been so incredibly vocal about, no, no, this is the next thing we need. And we're like, okay, we'll try to get you that, you know?